How many HLFs have you been to? This is the third one. Mm -hmm. Did you, were you at the first one? No, no, I missed the first two, unfortunately. Mm. If I'd known what they were like, I would I never have missed them. Well, tell me about your experience with them. Well, the the um, collection of absolutely brilliant lectures, uh, raising issues of interest to everybody in the audience, is, is just unparalleled. I mean, the, the lectures we heard this morning, I just did every one of them on a high. Um, and I'm still thinking and talking, and I'm looking forward to talking to the to the lecturers to ask some more questions and see whether any of the projected um, applications of their work that I can think of uh, are of interest to them. This is something that the laureates always say, is that they love hearing the other laureates. Yes. And um, a lot of the public focus is on laureates mentoring the young researchers, but it sounds like you see the, the laureates as, as mentors in a sense. Oh, yes, for me, myself, I, I'm learning a lot from them. Um, I'm still active, I think I'm active in research anyway, I'm enjoying it, and the things that they're saying resonate with uh, what I'm interested in. Do you think the, the, the young researchers, how do you think that they react best? What things do you think inspire them most? Um, I, it's unpredictable. I, I don't know what's going to inspire me most when I hear the lectures. I also suffer from the disadvantage that I'm sitting up front, so I can't see them. <laughs> so on the whole, I'm rather declining to answer that question. But I would have thought that um, uh, just the um, the interests and the style of presentation and the sort of obvious enthusiasm and brilliance of these people shines through, uh, even if they're talking about topics with, with which are unfamiliar and I've never been interested in before. So who were your mentors? Um, I think uh, in computer science, um, uh, my mentors were all um, uh, people whose works I had read not people that I knew personally. Uh, in the early days, um, I'm talking now about 1960, um, I read articles by um, um, John McCarthy, um, Edgar Dijkstra, um, uh, and, and others, which I even read Turing's paper uh, when I was an undergraduate and didn't understand a word of it. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, I'd better confess that I, I'm, I'm not a, a mathematician or, or computer scientist by, by um, education. I was educated as a philosopher and a linguist, and I, I don't even have a doctorate, so um, um, rather un, un, uh, non-standard um, uh, upbringing, you might say. Um, the um, people that I admired and inspired me um, were probably, first of all, Bertrand Russell, who was the, uh, wrote a book called The Introduction to the Philosophy of Mathematics, Mathematical Philosophy, sorry. Um, and I recently went to Amazon and bought a reprinted copy of it and read it through again with great pleasure. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I remembered quite a bit of it. Um, and since I I studied those subjects because I took a philosoph philosophical interest in the question of why mathematical proofs were so convincing. Why our mathematical truths seem to be so much more true than anything else that one might report about the real world. And what did you conclude? Well, uh, being young, I was rather iconoclastic, and the basic conclusion is that mathematics is just playing games with symbols. Um, I think since then I've learnt the error of my ways, and somehow or other their games are, are um, uh, motivated um, by considerations other than pure competitive um, sport. So it sounds like you're mentorship path, so to speak, was a more solitary one, that you didn't have people interacting, but you, 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 you it was mostly through books and written and papers and that I sort of thing? I think so, yes, yes. 
Um, that's, and of course, uh, I mean, that's what I basically remembered. I'm sure that uh, my tutors uh, on my course in, in uh, Oxford, um, uh, particularly John Lucas, who was a sort of um, com compu uh, philosopher of computing later on, um, uh, did have an influence on me. But since I was studying Latin and Greek, um, that uh, influence doesn't obtrude itself very often on my thinking, so we put it that way. I'm trying to remember, I'm sorry, I don't remember if you taught as well. I, I was a professor of computing for 30 years, um, first in the Queen's University, Belfast, and then for 22 years at Oxford. Oh, okay, so definitely you taught. <laughs> when I retired, I was the senior member of the mathematics faculty. But if you look at my qualifications, I wasn't even qualified to enter the faculty as a student. <laughs> Computer science is like that, or perhaps any new subject is like that. There were no degrees in computer science. If there had been, I, I might very well have chosen them. So during that time, I'm sure that there were a lot of times when students would be looking for a mentor. And, and what sort of approach did you give to mentoring, and I suppose here as well? Um, I just talk to them, and be as friendly as I can. Um, I am, uh, I, 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 somebody has um, created a, an academic genealogy for, for um, pe pe people whose, um, uh, who's, uh, my students, whose students are um, down to the third or fourth or sixth generation. And I think they counted a bit more than a hundred. Um, uh, of the notable ones, you mean? Yes, I, of course, it's a very skewed distribution. Some of, some of them are responsible. One of them is responsible for nearly half of all the total, so very prolific. Um, I still know him and talk to him. Um, and. Um, I hope maybe even to collaborate with him. So uh, talking about the HLF, since of course uh, that's part of the purpose of this, uh, this is the fifth year of the HLF. So let's look forward five years. What do you hope to happen in your field? Or what do you think will happen in your field in five years? Ah, oh, that I don't know. No, I've always been a bad predictor although a very lucky selector of lines of research which turn out to be um, uh, more useful uh, and um, more widely understood than, uh, than, than I ever deserved. Um, but I've always predicted that the computers would stop getting um, faster, um, much sooner than, they, than, it, than has actually happened. So I've stopped making predictions like that. Um, I've never predicted what people would use that extra speed for. So, and that would have been uh, a, a very good um, thing to predict. Um, of course, it's partly dependent on believing that they're going to go on getting faster and smaller and cheaper, which they have done by factors of a thousand in each dimension. Mm -hmm. So what are you working on? What's fascinating you these days? I'm interested in unification of theories of programming. The theory of programming is what should underlie the practice of programming. If programming is a really engineering discipline, it should have a scientific theory at its basis. And in fact it has. It's got many scientific theories as a basis. And so most of them say, and they're all competing with each other. So the practical engineer's response when the experts disagree is to say, oh, oh, go away and settle your differences and come back when you have. And they very rarely do. Can you give some examples of, of these competing theories of computation? Um, yes. Uh, the most important um, way of expressing a theory of programming is to assign a meaning to the programs written in a given programming language. 
It's called the semantics of the programming language. And there are three different ways of, or more than three, four, five, perhaps, perhaps many more that I don't know of, ways of describing the semantics of a programming language. Um, the one that I'm most best known for is by constructing a foundation and a formal system like the um, foundations of mathematics um, in which by use of um, a, a small and elegant number of elegant proof rules um, you can prove the correctness of any program. Um, and so I, I'm responsible for, for one such system which is called Hall Logic. Uh, the second school of semantics is based on operational semantics which uh, tells you how to implement a program expressed in the language. So that tells you how to look at a program and take its individual commands uh, one at a time and execute them one at a time and then come back to execute um, the appropriate next, next command as, as indicated by the structure of the program. Um, the third one, which I now favour a lot, is an algebraic approach where you just give a number of equations and inequations between programs saying that um, this program is equal to that program or, well, um, or maybe um, that this program is more uh, determined than that, that one. This, this, the one. One program may be quite abstract and I, I don't know in detail how it's going to behave but the other program is, is, is very specific and tells me exactly how it's going to behave. And that's a relationship, an inequality between uh, determinism and abstraction, which is absolutely vital, vital in the practical uh, use of uh, the theory uh, to develop programs, develop new programs, or to develop programs to meet an existing specification. Um, and this the basic um, ordering relationship of refinement, uh, as, a, as it's called, um, uh, can be given an uh, axiomatic, uh, can be used uh, to express a number of algebraic properties. For example, equality or equivalence is still expressible even though even in the in, even in the ordering, uh, if your primitive. Uh, concept is not equality but ordering by just requiring the ordering to hold in both directions. Um, program A is a refinement of program B and program B is a refinement of program A. And now you can express the properties of a program by very, very simple laws like associative law. If your program says do one thing and then do another, um, it satisfies a, uh, the then that you put to separate these two parts is like a multiplication sign. And it tells you that it, um, uh, you, you um, um, and therefore we can use it like a multiplication sign and ask whether it is associative or not. And the answer is it is. And it's obvious really, isn't it? Because if you do one thing and then another thing, and then a third thing. It's the same as doing one thing and then another thing and a third thing. So it doesn't really matter um, uh, to the outcome of the program, to, to, to what the, ac the program actually does, whether you put brackets around the, the, around the operator, the then operator, or whether you don't. And of course, modern programming languages take advantage of this and you don't have to put brackets around every operator except for one programming language called Lisp in which you have to put brackets around every operator <laughs> and it's horrible! <laughs> so I, I don't think that I asked you this about uh, sort of the stage of life that the young researchers are in. Uh, many of them are sort of early 20s, let's say. Um, and thinking back to when you were that age and what you were doing, how would you suggest they spend the next five years? Well, thinking back to uh, that age, uh, when I was that age, I wasn't doing research. So um, my, uh, compa the compa I don't really have a, 
a, a direct, direct um, comparison. But I do think they have a difficult time uh, these days of, of, of trying to make a research, uh, start off on a research career in, in a climate which is requiring researchers to produce very rapid results. Um, More so I, than your time. Uh, I, no, yeah, absolutely, yes. When I, um, I, I worked in industry for uh, um, eight years before going uh, uh, to university to, as a professor, and of course we had deadlines and we had to work reasonably fast, and although I, I failed abysmally to do it, um, we had to um, actually deliver our programs to customers. Um, but the um, after in the last two years that I was there, I was moved into the research laboratory, and I was started looking forward to designing new machines, um, which actually never came to fruition. Um, but the pressure to publish initially is is uh, very strong uh, for young young people, indeed everybody, and the pressure to choose um, topics that are going to give a, a, an immediate payback um, is also strong. And over on top of that, the pressure to choose a fashionable topic is very strong. So how would you recommend that they manage that stress? Ah, uh, how do I manage stress? Um, I think in the same way that everyone manages stress. Um, uh, there's no general uh, way of doing it. You, you just have to adapt to it and learn how to live with it. And that's going to depend on, on your background and your interests and how you, how you, how you choose to live. Any, anything else that you think we should have talked about or anything you'd care to say about the HLF? Or I never, un, un, um, never realized what the HLF was actually doing until I came to the first uh, meeting, my first meeting, which was uh, two, two occasions uh, ago. And I'm, it had never occurred to me that this was just a meeting between um, people with established uh, reputations and young students. Um, and now I see how valuable it is. I think um, it, it is important that people realize that at the end of the road there are some rather splendid people giving wonderful lectures <laughs> and um, that people whom you have only read and read about and maybe studied the work of indirectly uh, are real flesh and blood people. You can now remember their faces and whenever you read anything by them in future you will know what tone of voice to read it in. I think that's a good closing sentence. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank you. you taking the time. Great fun.